Why are you willing to do all this, Akechi-kun? Why do you seek justice? Because of sickening human beings. Yes. My contempt for such people drives my sense of justice. It isn't some grand reason like society's sake or some lofty ideal. It's simply an absurd grudge and extremely personal. And that is one of many reasons why this game is amazing. Now, Persona 5 is a game I've grown unique fondness for over the course of last year, and there was one character that stood out to me in particular, that character being Akechi. Part of the reason for that is probably my bias towards characters who have to persevere through some great internal struggle caused by psychological trauma that subtly influences their actions in a way where they end up having to spend almost as much time overcoming themselves as an obstacle as they do conflict with others along their journey that they perceive as one. Trauma that creates a dichotomy in the way a character expresses themselves that juggles back and forth between who they are in who they want to be, and I believe that describes Akechi to a T. Now, of course, a character this popular would receive and has received a lot of criticisms over the years in regards to his actions and development over the course of said story, but I do think there are some gems about certain themes surrounding him that go rather understated in my opinion. Now, I may or may not be overanalyzing what we have to work with, but I'll at least try to explain my rationale as to how we got from here to here. So let's get started. Alright, starting as a quick overview, Akechi is a detective, in air quotes, that serves as one of your many twisted parallels in the game and as your rival throughout story. He's directly competing with you to defeat the same person in a sort of race, orchestrated by an evil god named the Aldabaoth who's in a bet with another supernatural being named Igor to see which one of your wills are stronger in a game of his design for sport, all the while ultimately planning to subjugate the entirety of humanity into everlasting servitude and stagnation regardless of the outcome, as he's not exactly keen on playing fair. Throughout this game, you get plenty of chances to talk to and learn more about Akechi, some key details being he holds a strong grudge that even he on some level recognizes as absurd towards a particular person who had a direct hand in causing the chain of events that led to his mother spiraling off in a crippling depression and eventually death from it, presumably by suicide, which was ultimately a turn in his life for the absolute worst while he was still an impressionable child. This conveys to the audience one of two things, that one, Akechi is a character who's psychologically chained down by others past transgressions towards him and can't mentally move forward until he finds a suitable solution to these issues, to which two, serves as a driving force behind his actions. That event coupled with some inner monologuing are probably the most important pieces of information we have to understand in Akechi, as the story implies that the trauma he felt after experiencing the death of his mother had a lot of secondary effects on his mental state. What I mean by this is, due to Japanese culture's desire for conformity, Akechi's mom, who had birthed a child out of wedlock, was likely discriminated against, which would lead to feelings of shame or guilt, adding to her despair. Combine this with the fact that single mothers are often limited to poorly paid jobs and can barely make ends meet on their own, and it's quite easy to see how these subsequent events happened. The fault from this tragedy leads to the rest of what I'm going to be discussing since I believe her death is essentially what tipped the first domino in Akechi's compulsion to believe that who he fundamentally is as a person combined with his social status meant that he was worthless and unwanted by the rest of wider society. Case in point, he even says something to that effect himself, referring to himself as a cursed child for his mother, showing that on some level he at least partially blames himself for what had happened. To make matters worse, the death of his mother forced Akechi to be put in an orphanage and periodically migrate from one orphanage to the next as a result of this. Japanese orphanages haven't been the best in the past and have developed a bit of a reputation for their poor living conditions, often being understaffed and unable to properly tend to the children's needs, physically, emotionally, or otherwise, which could potentially be one of the reasons why he had to periodically migrate from one orphanage to the next in the first place. Carrying the stigma of being born illegitimately also meant that Akechi was undoubtedly discriminated against as well, at the very least earlier in his life, leading him to feeling further socially alienated. The compounding stress from experiencing these events once one after another would naturally make anyone so young a lot more introverted and cynical, which he expresses throughout the game in the form of some of his dialogue with the main characters as well as with his body language. For example, he mocks Maruki's attempts to be a good person in the Thieves' Den, saying it'll only get him taken advantage of. In addition to that, this mindset he displays runs directly parallel to size throughout her downward spiral that we witness for the majority of the game after she had to shoulder the burden of having to become financially stable left over as a consequence from her dad's death. 
both experienced the death of a family member, which became the catalyst for their motivations, leading them to believe that being a cutthroat person was a necessity in order to survive in a society that they live in. Valuing success over having consistent morals. It's probably also why they play off each other so well as partners. And I know it's kind of weird that I'm referencing the Thieves Den in the first place, since that's technically Joker's cognition of his allies, not the people themselves, but I'm fairly certain these bits of exposition wouldn't exist if it didn't flesh out their personalities just a little bit more. That and Joker is the closest to the vast majority of the people here, so I think it's safe to say that he'd have the most accurate interpretation of the characters in question. As for examples of what I mentioned prior about body language and such, whenever he's in a room, whether it be the hideout, the safe room, or the thieves' den, he'll choose to isolate himself away from everyone else. When you hang out with him, at least in Royal, he'll offhandedly mention how people often misunderstand him and how Joker's the only one he's brought to the jazz club, showing a distinct lack of closeness with other people. In Mementos, he may start a conversation, but he'll never join in on one, and in PQ2, Shinjiro remarks how they're both similar in that they don't fit in and can rather easily sense his distress. Well, him, Kormaru Ken, and even you for that matter. Despite things like his cynicism, the hole that Akechi's mother left by no longer being in his life anymore would mean that Akechi would grow to desperately desire emotional connections with other people. The game goes to great lengths to, well, outright tell us that this is the case. But a problem arises in that due to the trauma that Ketchy suffered from, he no longer accepts himself under the understandable but immature thought process that there's something wrong with him because for the longest time no one's acknowledged his presence. He instead opts for the more pragmatic approach of obtaining accolades such as being an honor student to boost his public image and even going so far as to create an alternative personality that he believes will gain favor with the general public. With much success, mind you. This shows one of the many parallels between him and the main character and how Akechi's mindset makes him come up short by comparison. As Joker was unjustly branded a criminal but actively finds ways to express himself in the manner of his choosing, while Akechi on the other hand experiences a similar form of discrimination but takes the opposite approach and actively tries to be something he isn't. Which of course has the exact opposite of its intended effect as not only does this validate Akechi's initial assumptions about the general public's values and their perception of him in his mind, but by being unable and or unwilling to open up to others, this has the the additional effect of him instinctively emotionally separating himself from his actions while putting on this front. Referencing the Thieves' Den again, he even says to Yusuke that putting on a facade no longer causes him to feel anything anymore since he's been doing it for so long. Like, Jesus Christ, man. Unfortunately for him, he won't be getting the support he so desperately needs anytime soon, as these mental ailments that plague him will go largely unaddressed before his early development in adolescent years. Now, one can easily argue from the information presented that Akechi's outlook on life would be understandably skewed as this all happened at such a young age. Since at the time, he had no one to turn to to help him work through this inner turmoil, of his, the best he can do is to make the most out of an unfortunate situation and begrudgingly acknowledge that he has no power to get justice on the one who made his life so difficult in the first place, despite his most earnest desire to and the bitterness that would naturally come with being unable to fulfill this goal. If he found a way to just change the dreary state of his current life, that'd be one thing. However, if he were granted a highly specific set of abilities that could make his life do a complete 180 in an instant, and also give him the chance to hurt anyone he so choose, the mental whiplash from such a status shift would probably go to his head and be bad for everyone involved, including himself. But that's when it happened. <laughs> that's when I learned about the cognitive world. Someone. God or demon gave me a chance. I couldn't contain my laughter. At this point in the story, Yaldabaoth and Axe's plan, needing two pawns of Greek potential and seeing a one mentally unsound younger 15-year-old Akechi as one of his perfect draft picks. Hopefully I've convinced you on some level that Akechi's reaction to obtaining these new abilities is going to be a lot more volatile due to the dismal circumstances surrounding his upbringing. The culmination of his social ills has now reached a climax, manifesting in two personas, one being Loki, representing who Akechi is, and Robin Hood, who Akechi wanted to be. It's like I mentioned before, he's had all of zero control over the major portions of his life up until this point. All of a sudden, he can entertain even the most manic of the possible ideas floating around in his head, all the while resolving himself to get his hands dirty if need be. On top of that, I'd say it's a safe bet that due to the social and emotional alienation he's experienced, Akechi would be more than willing to treat anyone he needs to with the same apathy and callousness that grew to be the norm for him, making these actions all the easier to commit to. In other words, this man is going to run wild. 
as briefly touched on before, I'd say it's less an option and more of an obligation, moral or otherwise, for Akechi, because now, in addition to having developed that sense of justice, he has the power and the will to act on it. Now, a lot of people really hated these turn of events for Akechi's character, especially his plan due to his end goal and all the horrible things he does to try to achieve that goal. It's easily one of the most, if not the most, criticized aspect of his character. I personally think it all makes sense, thematically speaking at the very least. But in order for me to explain all of that, I'll need to go all the way back here. So the story has a running theme of the value of your public appearance and how it can positively or negatively influence your behavior and social standing. There are too many examples of this to count. Akechi's mother committed suicide after succumbing to the depression that followed with her image being further tarnished by birthing an illegitimate child. The fall from that leads to everything I've told you so far about Akechi and his hatred for the person responsible being his father Shida, who does everything he did throughout the story to boost his public image so he could achieve the goal of becoming prime minister, and because he's a bit of a jerk. That affects our main character who has to keep a low profile after being sued, put on probation, and needing to transfer locations. After enrolling at the only school that'll accept him, the first person he meets is a social outcast named Ryuji, who along with an entire track team of people were abused daily by a PE teacher named Kamishida. When Ryuji retaliates after being provoked by him one day, he gets his leg broken in the conflict and Kamishida disbands the track team altogether. Kamishida's actions were further enabled because he got favoritism from the principal at that school for being a former Olympic athlete that brought the respective volleyball team to nationals. The worst part of that is that the former track members have its own grain into them to preserve their chances for future sports opportunities and such that they'd rather direct their ire towards Ryuji instead of Kamishida who is the source of the problem, accepting the abuse as a necessary evil they'd have to endure for the sake of securing their futures. And that's just to name a few examples, there's plenty more. Speaking of Kamishida, his abuse extends to their former coach as well who he got fired before the latter events happened. Both the men and women's volleyball teams and to your first three party members, one of which I've already mentioned in Ryuji, which indirectly or otherwise negatively impacts six of your confidants. He's got quite the track record. And because he's such a good person, he then proceeds to sexually harass one of your other party members named Alvin by attempting to blackmail him into providing sexual favors for him or else he threatens her best friend Shield's position on the women's volleyball team. The emotional stress caused by this situation wreaked havoc on her mental state to the point that she breaks down in tears to the first person she talks about this issue with. Shiho would then go on to attempt suicide as a result of being abused by Kamishida after On rejects his advances, further fueling On's vendetta towards the man. Shiho's mom would also have her transfer schools to avoid being labeled, which adds to my point about the theme I was explaining earlier. And this is all just in the first arc of the game. Now, where exactly am I going with this? Well, you see, there's a bit of poison imbued in her actions when she stops Kamishida from committing suicide because of this hatred. She even says herself that her decision was influenced by the desire to make Kamishida suffer as much as possible, leaving repenting for the rest of his life to be a fate worse than death for him. Conveniently enough for her, that decision just so happens to also help the most people. Akechi, on the other hand, wasn't so lucky. Keep in mind, she's had less time to be upset with Kamishida than Akechi's had with everything Shido put him through, and her situation got resolved fairly quickly by comparison. One can only imagine the utter misery someone will be driven to feel, being in a worse situation and unable to change the outcome for as long as what happened with Akechi. And that's one of the main takeaways from this. Akechi plans to be the sole reason why Shido's life's work was ripped away from him at the 11th hour, while getting the satisfaction of knowing that Shido's most valuable asset was the cause. Highlighting how who Shido was as a person was ultimately his undoing, living the rest of his life in disgrace with everything exposed to the general public. His past literally coming back to haunt him, which symbolically speaking is a fate worse than death in Akechi's eyes. It's kind of in the same vein as when Goku showed back up to defeat Frieza on Namek in a twist of dramatic irony, as this only happened due to Frieza marveling at the destruction he caused and being too distracted to notice that Goku escaped the massacre. Akechi's mindset during all of this is supposed to convey to the audience that he's the culmination of negative attributes that the Phantom Thieves either could have had or harbored at some point along their journey, but were fortunate enough to meet each other and grew as a result of that shared experience. He was a product of his environment and a victim that was unable to be saved before what many believe to be the point of no return. It thematically fits like a glove. So does his relationship with Joker and the many other parallels between them that are both formed and shown throughout the story. As previously mentioned, they're both prisoners of fate and had their lives ruined by the same person. Both of them are viewed by the general 
Republic in the light that's opposite to their modus operandi for a good portion of the game as well. They're also both tricksters with the main differences being that Joker mostly relies on his wit and companions while performing feats of what might as well be magic to the ignorant in the form of changing people's hearts, while Akechi is staying somewhat true to the lore of his persona Loki shapeshifts who he is, at least personality wise, to what he felt was convenient for him at the time. You can feel the weight of Joker's impact on Akechi in the story as he saw Akechi for who he is rather than what he wanted Joker to see at the time, and that resonated with Akechi. The two worlds he lives in, one where he has a goal that he works in tireless pursuit for, and the other where he has as a friend who'd be more than willing to help him get closure for his issues would soon no longer be able to coexist, with Akechi's biggest fear being that his hypocrisy would be laid bare for all to see. He's angered by the results Joker's made in such a short time, but he's only made those due to relying on other people, which Akechi can't do because of his irrational cling to the past, adamantly claiming that he doesn't need anyone while also saying he desires for someone to want him shortly after. Almost like a cry for help if I'm being honest. In stark contrast to the effort he's put into gaining others' recognition, he doesn't acknowledge most people and in some cases even looks down on them. In Makoto's case, he derides her for bending herself to the whims of other people while ultimately being dependent on the approval of other people himself, regardless of how much of that he thinks is his own decision or not. He does, however, regret the turn of events that have transpired showed both in PQ2's ending and in Shido's palace, because it's this hypocrisy and the inevitability of having to address it when coming face to face with the one person he can't creatively shy away from it around that ultimately causes him to snap. And it is a sight to behold when it happens. Yeah. I'll show you who I really am. Come, Loki! Again, it's that persona. What's going on? Don't make me laugh. Justice, righteous, keep that shit to yourselves. You and your teammates piss me off! You're going down! I'll destroy you! Go down with me! <laughs> now, let's see you drop dead one at a time in front of your precious friends! Die! And the Best Acted Villain Meltdown Award goes to... No, but seriously, Robbie Damon gave an immaculate performance in this scene. Godspeed to that man. Anyways, Akechi in the last ditch effort gambits everything by using his rampage ability on himself in a fit of pure insanity. And he's pretty strong too! The Phantom Thieves even admit that the only reason why they won was because it was an 8v1 fight and Akechi was arrogant enough to believe he could take them all at once. Akechi then calms down, accepting the reality of the situation, albeit in a dejected way convinced of his own worthlessness. The Phantom Thieves, who can sympathize with the situation, also inform him about all the redeemable qualities he hadn't recognized in himself up until now. In a way, he got the acknowledgement that he wanted, just not how he expected it to be received. Unfortunately, it was too little too late, as the brief exchange they had was met with the painfully thematically appropriate action of Shido's cognitive version of Akechi attempting to kill a weakened cast who exhausted themselves after fighting twice. The tragic irony of this is that his attempts to exploit his father's hubris and psychologically crush him ended with his own hubris being exploited, trapping him in a standoff where he has to face what might as well be a reflection of all of his mistakes. Akechi, out of obligation due to his defeat, foils his cognitive doppelganger's plans by sacrificing himself to stop him, making one final request before they part ways. And just listen to this man. Let's make a deal, okay? You won't say no, will you? Why at a time like this? Change Shido's heart. In my stead. End his crimes. Please! You can hear the desperation in Akechi's voice, begging Joker to finish what they both started, as he doesn't plan to make it out of this alive, and he truly believes that Shido is a despicable person whose karma hasn't caught up with him yet. Harkening back to what I was saying earlier about this partially being an obligation Akechi feels must be done, rather than just purely a selfish desire. Just to reiterate, Robbie Damon killed this role. Interestingly enough, this reminds me of Dragon Ball as well and how Vegeta cried on his deathbed on Namek, begging Goku to successfully avenge the Saiyan race. Akechi's story unfortunately ends here in the base version of the game, with him understanding in his final moments both in a literal and metaphorical sense that he was his own worst enemy. A conclusion many found to be abrupt and unsatisfying given the role he played up until his departure. Base version being the key words here, because now that we're in Royal, there's no need for that. 
you. This last arc was far and away the best thing for Akechi's character, which is saying a lot considering how much I enjoyed everything that I've mentioned before. Now, Royal does a lot of things better from Akechi's overhauled confidant to the improved game mechanics to the inclusion of even more quality music adding to this already phenomenal soundtrack. But more than anything else, the way they use Akechi in the last arc of this game is nothing short of spectacular and the writers of this section really did him justice. It's honestly everything about his involvement, from when he atones for his crimes by turning himself in in your place to how the story takes advantage of his already well-established autonomy and genius-level intellect to help your main character progress the plot and pace the story better. His personality is what really sells it all, though. It's par for the course, but still amusing to me how a character can gain even broader appeal once he started behaving as himself and stops trying to please other people. Poetry in motion, I tell you. There's a certain charm to his snarky, no-nonsense attitude that makes for some great character interactions to the point where if he, Joker, and Kasumi were the only ones in this arc, I personally wouldn't complain. They have such good chemistry that I don't see myself getting bored with this group anytime soon. We also get to use Loki too, you really do love to see it. Akechi's also such a chad that he gets an entirely new all-out attack finishing touchscreen asserting his ever-present dominance over the majority of the cast. He's even your navigator for a moment, and the lines they gave this man easily provided the most entertainment value of the three to me, and many others by the looks of it, considering there's a bunch of highly viewed videos on YouTube right now that are just compilations of Akechi's navigator dialogue. If that isn't a big enough indication that people want this as an option, then I don't know what is. He has far and away the best showtime in the game, and I don't think there's any debating that whatsoever. And he would be the guy asking all the deep philosophical questions if you decide to hang out with him. Lastly, I gotta talk about that conversation before the heist. When he's offered the opportunity to return to a better version of his old life, what does my man say? I'll let you listen, because this right here, this is something special. I will carve my own path for myself. I refuse to accept a reality concocted by someone else, stuck under their control for the rest of my days. So what? That's the path I chose. All you have to do is stick to your guns and challenge Maruki. Or are you really so spineless that you'd fold over some bullshit trivial threat on my life? It is. Do you think I'd be happy with this? Being shown mercy now, of all times. I don't want to be pitied. This isn't something I'm debating with you. Your indecisiveness on the matter is essentially a betrayal of my wishes. I want to hear you say it aloud. What do you intend to do? I won't wait a moment longer. Answer me. All right. I'm relieved to hear it. I will never accept this form of reality. I'm done being manipulated. Let's go back to our true reality. Now that's how you finish a character arc. I'm talking peak satisfaction here, absolutely beautiful. You can't sit here and lie to me like that wasn't fire. I won't allow it. And look at that persona. His third tier persona's design is one of my two favorites because of course it is. His response is perfect. Coming to the hard to argue conclusion that the happiness obtained at the cost of freedom is no different an outcome for him than the shallow recognition he received as a celebrity when he was effectively Shido's lapdog and would rather die than go back to being that person again. You don't have to like anything else about this character, but you gotta respect that. Choosing to rather be dead and free than be alive and held in captivity is definitely a more dignified and satisfying note to go out on. I'm sure most can agree. So yeah, I think Akechi is pretty cool. Definitely understand why this guy is a major fan favorite. He's charismatic enough to keep you interested in his development whenever he's on screen, and his flaws are both numerous and visible, which unironically makes him a more interesting character, at least for me. Most of all, the way the story is structured, you understand how he got to this point, and I think that's very important for the type of character Akechi is. To his last, dying breath, he is snarky, brutally honest with both himself and everyone else, violent to the point where it's comical and completely unwavering in his convictions. And you know what? He's all the better for it. With that being said, thank you all for sticking around to the end of the video. I'd really appreciate it if you all could like, comment, and maybe subscribe for future content. Let's get some traction going. Also, feel free to give me any additional feedback if you want to. That's all for now, though. 
This is Eon saying, I'm out of here.